is about debugging Ruby. Uh, these slides are up on Scrib. Uh, you can go to bit.ly slash debugging Ruby and follow along if you want. Uh, my name is Amon. I go by TMM1 on GitHub and Twitter. Um, and like me, uh, in writing Ruby code, you've probably run into a couple things. One is nasty bugs. Uh, slow code, Ruby's known to be sort of slow. And memory bloat. And this talk is essentially about tools that you can use to fix these issues. You know, tools help you debug. Um, and so we're going to talk about a bunch of these tools. And these are tools for Linux, since uh, most of us deploy on Linux. And it's pretty useful to be able to debug issues that happen in production. Tools for C code, since MRI and most of the extensions we use are written in C. Uh, tools for networks, since most of us are working on web applications that talk to web services and databases and other web applications. And of course, tools for CPU and memory usage, since ultimately that determines how far we can scale and how much it costs to actually run and maintain our Ruby applications. So one quick note before I dive into these tools. Uh, a lot of these slides have a lot of fine print, essentially. Uh, details on how to get up and running, what flags to use, what command line options I use these tools with. I'm going to gloss over these, but the idea is basically uh, what I want you guys to focus on is what are these tools useful for, when would you use them, why would you use them, and then later on when you actually find a reason to use them, you can come back to these slides and look at all the options that I use and I recommend and copy and paste the commands in to get up and running. Uh, so don't let those details bother you for now, but be sure to check them out later when you're actually trying to get up and running. So the first tool is LSUG. Uh, this is something that's available on your Macs, if you have a Mac, and runs on Linux as well. Uh, it's essentially used to list open files. So you would run this on any PID, basically. And the cool thing about this is you can take any running process on your system, Ruby or not, and run LSL on it and get a sense of what it's doing. And this is usually the first thing I'll run because it sort of gives you a high level overview of what the process is doing, what it's all about. And so you'd run it and you would see some output like this and immediately you start <coughs> noticing some things. Uh, first of all, you'll see it's pulling in some shared libraries. And in this case, we see the JSON library, we see the Memcache library, we see the MySQL library. In addition to the shared libraries, it also lists all the open files and open sockets. And so uh, you'll see there's connections, actually two connections, to a MySQL server running on port 3306, and another connection to a Memcache server uh, running on localhost port 11211. In addition to that, there's a HP outgoing connection, presumably talking to some sort of web service. Uh, and there's other random stuff you'll notice in there, the current working directory of the Rails application. You'll notice that STD out and STD error both point to an Nginx error log. Uh, and then there's this rack multi-part file, which is presumably dealing with some sort of file upload. So that's also, uh, again, it's pretty useful because you can run it against any process and sort of see what is it doing, get a sense of what that process is all about. The next tool is strace. strace is a Linux-only tool that creates its system calls and signals. So system calls are basically calls to functions that are defined in the kernel. When you make a system call, you switch out of user space and into kernel space and basically execute a function that was defined in the kernel. The cool thing about strace is similarly to LSO, you can run it against any running process uh, by just providing a PID. And it actually prints in real time all the system calls as they happen. So you can attach to any process and watch it actually calling functions in the kernel. So there's two ways that I like to run strace. One is in the summary mode with the dash C flag. And the way this works is you attach, you run it for a while, and then you, when you control C, it'll print out a summary of what happened during the time when it was running. And basically what it does is shows you what system calls were called most often and where you're spending the most amount of time. Uh, this is pretty typical for any sort of web application. If you're doing a lot of reads and writes. Uh, usually you're talking, you know, you're reading back data from the MySQL server or uh, web, app, web services, stuff like that. And so most of the time, 50% of the time here was spent reading 
uh, from different sockets. So that's summary mode. The other mode is tracing mode, which is sort of the normal mode. Uh, and I use a bunch of flags that are listed over here, but we end up with output that looks like this. And it basically streams in real time, or you can tell it a file to pipe into. Uh, so if you take a closer look at this output, it basically shows you all of the details for every single system call that's going through the system for that specific process. And so you might start noticing certain things. Uh, for instance, a Rails application will be doing a lot of reads, and presumably we'll be getting incoming HTTP requests. And so here you can see it's reading from file script 22, uh, and it's reading what looks like an incoming HTTP request. And it tells you some details, such as how long that read took and how many bytes it ended up reading. Again, file script 22, if you remember back to the LSL output, you could run LSL on this process and see what file script 22 points to and see the port and the IP that it maps to. Uh, and so you could get the client's IP. Another thing you might notice is lots of reads and writes from MySQL database. And so again, here, file descriptor 5 corresponds to a MySQL connection. And you can see we write a select statement. Uh, it's pretty fast. And then we read the response from the MySQL server. And you'll notice on the right, it shows that that read took about a second, almost a second and a half. And so that right there is indicative of a slow MySQL query. So I've used S-Trace a lot. Uh, it's actually really cool. You can run it on any process, like I said, and sort of get a sense of what's going on. So one of the first things I did was, you know, on a production Ruby instance, ran S-Trace on a bunch of my Rails applications. And one thing I noticed was output like this. Tons and tons of signals, uh, SIG DTLR. And I was wondering, you know, what's going on here? And I started digging into it a little bit. And it turns out Ruby 1.8 sort of uses, uses the SIG DTLR signal to manage its green threads. And basically, it tells the kernel, send me the signal every 10 milliseconds. And that way, I know every 10 milliseconds to switch threads. The problem with this was my application was not using any threads. And I was still seeing this. Uh, and so I started digging into this and came up with a very simple patch. And the problem was basically, once you started a thread, an additional thread, even if that thread went away, it would continue getting the signal for the entirety of the process. And so I submitted a patch uh, that was recently accepted. It took about a year to get accepted, but it is going to be part of Ruby 188. And it basically, uh, all it does is, as soon as the last additional thread dies, it kills off the timer. And so you're no longer getting interrupted. Another thing I noticed in uh, S-Tracing Ruby processes was, again, this is summary mode, tons and tons of calls. Here, there's almost 3.5 million calls to a function called RT sig product maps. And so I started digging into this. And what was going on here was uh, the default builds for Ruby on Debian, Red Hat, and Ubuntu all compile with a flag called enable pthread. And this actually doesn't use native pthreads. It, uh, it's sort of misleading. But what it does is instead of telling the kernel to send it that sig bt alarm, it spawns off one additional kernel level thread to do that timer. Uh, the problem was. Because of, the, because of a slight bug in the configure script, in addition to enabling that additional thread timer, it would uh, also force using sig proc mask every time a signal was delivered. And so this actually caused a huge slowdown, a 30% slowdown, which is why most people recommend that you don't use the default Debian packages for Ruby when you're deploying to production systems. Uh, and so again, I submitted a patch to this, which is now part of 188, and uh, as of the next Debian release, they actually incorporated the patch as well. So this is no longer going to be an issue. But again, you know, something as simple as just S-tracing your process, looking at what's going on, and sort of asking questions about what is this, you know, and sort of dig into it a little bit, leads to pretty major wins and a better understanding of what's going on under the hood. The next tool is TCP dump. Uh, question. Question. Oh, yeah, question. Do you know if uh, RVM enables pthreads when you are in RVM does not enable pthread by default. Okay. Uh, the only reason that Debian does this is because the only reason it's recommended to enable pthread is if you're using Ruby TK. Okay. And uh, you know Debian has to sort of accommodate everybody, whereas most uh, of us don't use Ruby TK and RE and other builds don't enable by default. Yeah, over here. Should you enable pthread on Ruby 1.9? 
Um, Ruby 1.9 probably doesn't have this option because the threading model is completely different and there are no more green threads. There's fibers that are the equivalent of green threads, but threads by default Ruby 1.9 are actual native threads. Any more questions? I'm going to stop uh, probably at the end of each tool to get any questions, just so it's a little bit easier. So the next tool is TCP dump. Uh, this is really useful for networking. And again, like I said, most of us are writing sort of web applications and applications that are talking a lot of different network services. Uh, again, there's a bunch of options that you can use. What it boils down to, basically, is an expression that you pass in. And that expression dictates what sort of traffic you want to watch for. And so you can type an expression such as this one, you know, find me all TCP traffic that's going to port 80. And that's basically, you know, outgoing HTTP requests. And so you'll start seeing uh, both incoming and outgoing HTTP requests. And you can s sort of get a sense of what's going on on the system. And, uh, you know, here you'll see here's an HTTP request that was probably incoming for a PNG. And you can see what IP it came from, what IP it's going to, et cetera. Similarly, you can do the same thing for MySQL. Uh, start seeing MySQL queries coming in and out. But probably the most useful way to use TCP dump is with dash W, which basically takes all the data and puts it into a file. And the cool thing about this is you can run this on your server, collect a bunch of data, you know something weird's happening, you know, either with MySQL or Memcache or some sort of web service, you're hitting maybe a Twilio API, and you can write an expression to capture only that data run it to a file, and then download that file and load it into Wireshark. And Wireshark is an awesome utility. It's all you know, a really nice GUI. And the cool thing is it understands a lot of protocols. And so it will show you, you know, here's an HP request. And it basically parses out all the headers from the TCP data. And you can drill down into the actual protocol. And it understands all the major protocols. So it makes it really easy to dive into uh, problems and try to figure out what's going on. So any questions about TCP dump? Cool. Next tool is Perf Tools. Uh, Perf Tools is actually a set of tools that came out of Google, um, and it's used in in Google uh, on their production systems. And it's actually really, really nice. Uh, here's again a bunch of details on how to get up and running. You basically have to download it, set it up, and then the way it works is you it provides a shared library that you can either link against or LD preload. And then as long as you're linked against the library, all you have to set is an environment variable called CPU profile to tell it where to dump the profile information. And once you have that, you can use the pprof tool to analyze that profile and give you a bunch of data. The really cool thing about this is it provides a, a graphical output uh, like that on the right. And basically, just by looking at that, you can see where most of your time is being spent. Because the bigger the box is, uh, the more expensive that operation is. So again, I ran this you know, on, on a bunch of my Ruby stuff. And the first thing I did, again, since this is a sampling profiler, it's fairly low overhead. And you can actually run it in production if you want. And so I ran this on a production MRI instance and just wanted to get a sense of what's going on inside MRI. And I found something pretty interesting. About 10% of the time was being spent in a function uh, rv store sub bang, which translates to string sub bang in Ruby land. And I was able to trace this back to the time.parse function. And so 10% of CPU time in my production Rails instance was being spent essentially parsing out time being fed back from MySQL. And I was curious what was going on. I pulled up the time.parse code. It looks something like this over here, where it basically runs a series of about two dozen regexes on your string uh, because it supports a bunch of different time formats. So. Uh, that was pretty useful, and the solution for that was to switch to uh, one of a variety of different solutions for time parsing. There's a bunch of gems, uh, home run, third base, uh, a bunch of other ones that basically move all that logic into C. Also, the new MySQL 2 adapter does all this stuff in C because it knows exactly what the MySQL format stream is going to look like. And so you basically save 10% of CPU cycles. Uh, I also ran this on event machine, so I maintain event machine, and for a long time there was a known issue where an event machine and Ruby's green threads did not interact well together. And so I ran first tool, and 26% of the time was being spent in memcopy. Uh, and it turns out uh, you can actually follow the memcopy up and see 
it's being called from RB thread save and restore context. And so what was going on here was a weird interaction in between how Ruby's green threads basically switched state. And event machine was doing something weird uh, where it was allocating a bunch of stuff on the thread stacks. And so it was spending a lot of time copying that state in and out. But once I knew what was going on, it was really easy to go in and one, fix event machine so it wasn't allocating so much stuff on the thread stack. But also, uh, we spent some time, Joe and I, um, patching Ruby itself so that it didn't need these mem copies in the case where you were deploying on a, an Intel CPU. So again, you know, a simple tool, and the whole idea here is when you run into a bug, you need to sort of uh, get started. And a lot of these tools provide a way to get you a little bit of data so you know where to start looking. And once you know what functions to start looking at, you can set a breakpoint there, you can sort of put printfs in there, you can do any number of things to figure out what the exact issue is once you know where to start looking. So Perf Tools was really cool, but uh, the thing I wanted was, you know, after running this a few times, I was like, it'd be really nice if these graphs actually showed me Ruby functions instead of C functions. And you know, in some cases, it's easy to see RB store sub bang and sort of understand that that actually corresponds to string sub bang, but it wouldn't be awesome for that actually said string sub bang in there. So I created this project called perftools.rb, which is essentially a fork of, of the project that adds Ruby support to. So again, here's how you get started. Uh, you can just install it. But simple example, here's a simple Sinatra application. It has two actions. One is sleep heavy, sort of weight heavy, so it's not actually doing anything on the CPU, but it takes a long amount of time. It's sleeping for a quarter second. The other one is CPU heavy. So it's basically uh, calculating the first 10,000 Fibonacci numbers. So you can run, uh, run perftools.rb on this, and I'm sending each of those requests 50, each of those actions 50 requests. And what I end up with is, again, graphs like this. And so there's actually two different modes you can run perftools.rb in. One is the regular mode, which is the CPU profiler mode, and one is the real-time mode. And so on the right, in the CPU profiler mode, of course, the compute function shows up at the top because it's doing a lot of CPU burning. And in the real-time mode, the sleep function shows up on top because it's not as CPU intensive, but it actually takes long. And so you can run it in both, and you know, on the left, in real-time mode, stuff like uh, HP requests and MySQL calls and anything that's sort of I.O. intensive is gonna show up. Whereas on the right, anything that CPU tells it is going to show up. So again, I use this on a bunch of projects. Early versions of Redis RB uh, would use the system timer jam on every single operation. And that was really expensive. Uh, and it was really easy to see in here. And so uh, we were actually able to go in and get rid of that and only use that when connecting uh, and use normal TCP socket timeouts for the actual read and write operations. Uh, it's actually also really cool. This sort of graphical output that gets created for just understanding a piece of code and um, sort of seeing you know, the call paths and how, how the functions call each other and how the code is laid out. And so for instance, running this on RubyGems, you'll notice like a RubyGems uh, spends a lot of time querying the file system because it's trying to figure out where the gem specs are and what gem specs, especially when you require a file that has to go on the file system and check all the load paths and try to figure out where that file is. And you can sort of see, you know, like where these are getting called from, and start looking, uh, start looking for spots that you can sort of optimize these things. Uh, recently, I ran this on Bundler, and I noticed that about 23% of time when running Bundle install was being spent in Gem version Spaceship. Uh, it was basically comparing a bunch of Gem version objects, trying to figure out which one to install. Uh, and so I knew there was some sort of optimization that could be done in there. And a simple patch to RubyGems uh, was able to improve the performance, overall performance of bundle install by about 15%. And it was just some micro optimizations in gem version. But knowing that a lot of time was spent there, you know, those micro optimizations actually made a big difference overall. And then finally, this is actually really recent, probably uh, a couple weeks ago, I added an object allocation mode to perftools.rb. And so in this mode, each sample corresponds to one object that was created. And in Ruby, it's really easy um, to create objects, and objects are actually rather expensive. And it's nice to be able to see you know, what functions are creating a lot of them. 
because the more objects you create, the more work GC has to do to garbage collect those objects. Uh, the more memory, the more peak memory usage you end up hitting. Uh, so again, this is on a Rails application running in the object allocation provider mode. And you can see, again, date parsing and time parsing is not only CPU intensive, but also when you're doing it Ruby, creates a lot of objects because you're doing a lot of string manipulation. Uh, and again, we switched to MySQL 2 recently, and all of this stuff went away uh, because they all moved down into C, and so you were no longer creating, you know, like 16% of the Ruby objects created overall were being created in date parse. So that's Perptools at RB. Any questions about that? Cool. So the next tool is Ltrace. Ltrace is uh, very similar to strace, but instead of tracing system calls, it traces library calls. Uh, again, you can run it in summary mode, or you can run it in a tracing mode. Uh, so this is the example from before with the mem machine and, and threading. And again, this is just sort of confirms that mem copy was taking a long time. And you could actually see that the mem copies were happening right after each SIGVT alarm. So the kernel would tell the process, you know, it's time to switch threads, and it would do two mem copies. And you can actually see the arguments to mem copy where it's copying, in this case, over a meg back and forth every time it was doing a context switch. And that was because the event machine was allocating a bunch of stuff on the thread stacks. And again, this is cool because you can actually see it happen in real time, and you can see the arguments. Uh, but the big problem with Ltrace is that it doesn't work with Ruby extensions. And the reason for this is because they're loaded at runtime and not they're not linked at compile time. So Joe D'Amato worked on a, uh, a branch of Ltrace that adds libdl support. Uh, so here's how you use it. There's a bunch of options that he added. But basically what it lets you do is trace calls to any C function inside Ruby. And so you can go ahead and trace all the calls to garbage collect, for instance. And so you can actually watch in real time. You know, All you're doing is passing a PID to a running process, and you can start watching in real time when a garbage collection is happening and how long it's taking. And so here you can see this, you know, this was again a production uh, Ruby instance I was running it against. Every garbage collection cycle was taking about 200 milliseconds, and it was running almost every five seconds. And so what that means is, you know, in Ruby, in MRI at least, and even in 1.9, uh, the GC is stop the world GC. And so if the garbage collection gets invoked during a uh, request response cycle, that's 200 milliseconds that's going to be added to the response time. Uh, similarly, you can run this against other queries, other, uh, sorry, other function calls. So here's the query function in lib MySQL. And so you can actually watch all the MySQL queries and how long they took. Uh, you could do this for memcache. Uh, I've used this in the past to try to figure out uh, where cache collisions are happening. And you can just you know run this uh, for a couple hours and then run a Ruby script on the output to try to do some analysis. So that's Ltrace. Any questions? Yeah. So in one of the first ones you showed that uh, memcopy was being used exorbitantly by a machine. Uh, how did you get from a memcopy up to figuring out that it was a vent machine doing it? Uh, the easiest way is with GDB. So you uh, attach to the process and set a breakpoint, and then you can basically check the, the entire stack trace. Uh, I'm going to dive into that a little bit. So any other questions? Yeah. Uh, she's looking at code, I guess. Question, yeah, the, the question was, how do you get the function name in the first place uh, so you know what to L-trace? Uh, and this was just, I guess, you know, I knew MySQL was making queries, so I pulled up lib MySQL client and tried to figure out what, what functions to start tracing. And the thing you have to do with this is actually provide the function signature so it knows uh, how to show the arguments. So you just give it an L-trace comp that has all the function signatures you care about. So GDB, GDB is like the standard C debugger. Um, and since we're all using, again, MRI, which is written in C, and a bunch of C extensions, it's a pretty useful tool overall. Uh, the most useful use case for this is debugging seg faults. So every now and then, you'll end up you know, seg faulting, and you have no idea what to do. Uh, and you end up, you know, Ruby tells you that, and that's not really useful. Ruby 1.9 actually shows you a backtrace, a C-level and a Ruby-level backtrace, which is far more useful. Uh, but to sort of demonstrate this, I wrote a simple C extension that defines a global seg v function. So whenever we call seg v, it's going to seg fault. And then I wrote a simple Ruby script that does a bunch of stuff before seg fault. 
So it's uh, you know doing four dot times and a dir dot th dir, a hash dot mu, and then finally the segfault. So there's two ways to CAD segfaults inside GDB. One is to attach to a running process. And you'll notice a lot of these tools have sort of a strong emphasis on being able to attach to a running process. And this is really useful because a lot of times you have problems that show up in production, and it's really hard to replicate them on you know, a different environment. Your Mac is a different environment than your Linux production system. And it's hard to replicate them. And so it's really useful to be able to go to your production box and say, you know, attach to this process right here and start seeing what's going on. Uh, so the way, way this works, you, you know, find the pit of your process, attach to it, and it's going to drop you at a prompt and you hit continue or C, and that basically waits until something happens. And something in this case is going to be a cycle. And so it's going to sit there until you hit the cycle. The other way to do it is to force the process to core dump. Uh, the way this works is you have to do a couple things. One, you have to tell the kernel where to put your core dumps. And two, you have to, inside your process, set the max limit of how big your core dump is allowed to be. By default, this limit is set to zero, which is why you never get a core dump. Uh, if you know your process is about 300 megs usually, you know, you can set it to 300 megs. And as long as it's under 300 megs, it'll dump out a core dump to whatever directory you told it to dump it out to. So once you have a core dump or you caught it inside GDB, uh, all you have to do is type where or backtrace, and it basically shows you the entire C stack trace. And once you have this, I mean, you could start looking at the final line numbers, or the easiest thing to do is just copy and paste this into a GitHub issue or something. At least let uh, the maintainer know sort of what's going on. They're going to have enough knowledge about their code base where they can start looking at this issue and try to solve it. So again, here, if you remember, you know, we called four dot times, dir ch dir hash new, and you can see the C equivalents of all those inside your backtrace. And so you see int do times in numeric dot C, which calls rb yield, and you end up in dir dot C, and you end up in hash dot C, and you can see how that relates to your C code. Which, again, was useful, but what I really wanted was the actual Ruby functions inside my backtrace. And so, again, I worked on a project called gdb.rb, uh, which just adds a bunch of Ruby level hooks to GDB. Uh, so you can do a bunch of cool stuff in here. Again, you can attach to any process, and you can start evaluate, evaluating the Ruby code inside the context of that application. Uh, so again, you know, you're running thread.current or thread.list size, and you're actually getting details about that Ruby process. Uh, you can get a lot of details about the threads, so how many threads are running, which one's currently running, what state they're in. You know, the third one down there is waiting on a file descriptor, five. Again, I could run LSL on this process and see what file descriptor five is. Uh, the first thread, which is the main thread, is waiting uh, on another thread, which is the third thread down there. So interesting details. It also provides a little bit of introspection into object space and what types of objects uh, exist. And so here you can see there's, you know, about uh, 900,000 live objects, and 83% of those are nodes. And so it sort of gives you a sense uh, how much, of how much memory you're using, how many objects you have created, and you can start to see if there's memory leaks in certain areas. And then you can actually even dive into different types of objects. Uh, so you can dive into all the strings and see you know, if there's a certain string that's being repeated over and over again unnecessarily. So again, going back to the example from before, we have the seg fault. And now with gdb.rb, instead of just running backtrace, we can run Ruby threads and see the stack trace for that thread. And instead of getting C level file and line numbers, we're getting Ruby level file and line numbers. And it makes it much easier to debug. So again, I've used this on a bunch of projects to fix a bunch of issues. Uh, the first one was Rails Warden, uh, which had a weird leak. Rails Warden is basically sort of an authentication and authorization framework. And what was going on here was it was injecting a rack middleware, but the middleware was leaking. And since middleware has references to the previous and next middleware, it's basically causing a leak of all the middleware in the chain. And so we, this was a production application, again, that had about 4,000 requests. And so there were 4,000 instances of every single middleware. And once, once we saw this, we were like, OK, we know where to start looking. At least we know why this process is taking up a gig of RAM. Let's start looking at all these middleware and try to figure out what's going on. 
fix this issue. Uh, another interesting thing I noticed, just running this in production, uh, Mongrel has this really strange piece of code in it where every single Mongrel instance has one thread that all it's doing is a loop sleep one. And the only reason I came across this was, again, I was looking at all the threads inside uh, a Rails instance, and I saw there's this thread in mongrel configurator.rb that's just doing a sleep. And I went to look through the code, and it's just like the global thread that exists for no reason, as far as I can tell. Uh, the next one is God. God, for a long time, had a lot of memory leaks. And using gp.rb, Eric Linval was able to find at least five separate leaks and fix them all. And so God is now very, very stable. And he's been running it uh, for the last year without any leaks. And again, you know, you can run, you can dive into all the arrays. And what we noticed was there were a bunch of arrays that had almost 100,000 elements. And so these were arrays that were just constantly growing. Uh, and so we knew something was going on there. And again, just looking at instances, there were, you know, a bunch of driver events, and even watches, 43 watches, even though I'm just watching one process. There's 43 instances of God watch. Something's going on there. So that's GDB and GDBRB. Any questions? Cool. Next tool is uh, Bleak House. And so a lot of tools we covered so far are sort of standard Linux and Linux, Linux and uh, C utilities. Uh, one thing that's unique about Ruby is the way it manages memory, which is very different than you do it in C. C is all about explicit memory management allocating, deallocating stuff, where in Ruby land, you just sort of create objects and let the garbage collector deal with it. Uh, the problem with this is it's really easy to leak references or hold references such that the garbage collector thinks a certain object is still in use, and it's not going to get rid of that object. And so there's a, a variety of tools that help figure out where these objects exist, where they were created, and why they're sticking around. So the first one is Bleak House. Uh, Bleak House is similar to, so gdb.rb you know, shows you what sort of objects exist, but Bleak House goes a step further and when it actually tells you where those objects were created, which is extremely useful because there's specific parts of your code that's, that are leaking objects, right? And so um, the caveat, of course, is that you actually have to install a patched version of Ruby and reinstall all your gems and then use that separate Ruby to run your application. But once you do that, you, you can get reports like this that basically show you for each file, line, and object type combination how many objects still exist. And so you might notice you know, there's 5,000 objects, uh, 5,000 strings, but then you actually get the file line number. You can go to that piece of code and try to figure out you know, why they're being created and why they're, why they're sticking around. Uh, the next tool. That's sort of similar in a similar vein. Um, oh. Before we move on, oh, yeah, Bleak House, uh, sure. with uh, Bleak House, you say you have to patch your Ruby VM and then reinstall the gems. Does it have any performance load if you're not actively debugging your code? Uh, yes. So the question was, what is the performance impact of Bleak House? And basically what it does is, uh, for each object that's created, it saves somewhere the file and line number. Uh, so CPU-wise, it's not that intensive, but it increases the size of each Ruby object because it adds uh, two fields to it. And so your memory usage will increase, uh, which might or might not be OK. Would for you production. recommend running that in production then? Uh, usually, it's not recommended to run in production. I mean, if, if you have enough memory on your box, you can. Um, I'm going to talk about a tool that's a little bit easier to use and you can turn on and off. Uh, question over here? What do you feel about Bleak House and RVM? Uh, the question was, how do I feel about RVM and Bleak House? Like, does it play well? Uh, yeah, so the, the way this works is when you gem install Bleak House, it'll actually download and compile Ruby. Uh, it'll probably be pretty easy to just add an RVM build for Bleak House. Uh, I think, so Evan, Evan Weaver wrote this and used it on Twitter for a while, but I think it's mostly superseded by the next tool, Memprot, uh, just because Memprot's a lot easier to use and you can turn it on and off. So I'm actually not going to talk about Memprof uh, at, at length because there's not that much time. Uh, but if you're interested in checking it out, bit.ly slash Memprof is a talk I did a while ago about Memprof. Uh, so the cool thing about this is basically it came out of, it's sort of the evolution of gdb.rb and Bleak House in that it does not 
require any patches. It's just a gem that you load. And in addition to telling you what types of objects and where they were created, it also tells you where the references are that are holding that object. So the coolest feature by far of Memprof is that you can basically snapshot any Ruby application and upload the set of all objects to memprof.com. And you get this sort of GUI that you can start clicking around to navigate all of those objects. And so for instance, you could click on an array and see all the, the elements of that array. Or you could click on the references for that array and see what other objects are referencing it. Um, actually, I think I have a few minutes, so I'll run through a quick example of how to use this. So I used, uh, we were using Rails 3 in dev mode, and we noticed, this was Rails 3 beta 1, and we noticed that uh, over time it would get slower and slower, and it was actually leaking a bunch of memory. Uh, so you know, by the end of the day, my Rails application was 2 gigs and uh, basically crawling. And so I decided, you know, let's try to use memprop to try to figure out what's going on. And so all you do is, first step, you know, load in memprop. Uh, and then we boot up our application, send it 30 requests, and that was enough to make it leak. And the way you use memprop is you basically run it and give it a PID and uh, your API key and stuff. And basically what it does is it attaches to that PID, dumps out all the objects, and then uploads that dump to memprop. It gives you a link, and so you end up on a page like this. And so you can start clicking around, trying to figure out what's going on. I clicked on the classes by name, uh, just clicking around. And so I ended up like on a page like this. And you know, uh, this is all built on MongoDB. And so at the top there, you see the MongoDB query and the number of, number of results and basically a view of all the results. And so what I noticed here was there were 30 copies of test controllers which is really interesting because I sent exactly 30 requests to the application. So I knew something was going on there. So I clicked on that. And again, it just does another model query where it's saying, show me all of the classes that have the name test controller. And so you see all 30 of them with their memory addresses. So I clicked on one of those uh, to get details about it. And then I clicked on references. And so again, here you can see all of the other objects that are referencing this test controller. And so if there were no references, garbage collection would go, oh, there's no references, let me get rid of this object. But as long as there's references, it's going to stick around. So in this list of references, I noticed a hash that had length 30. Again, 30 requests, 30 copies, a hash with exactly 30 elements. That's probably where the leak is. So you click on that, you get details about it. And sure enough, uh, there's all of your test controllers. And so what's going on over here is, uh, it's using the controller class as the key into a hash, and it tells you where this hash is being allocated. So it's basically telling you what line to look at. Uh, and it was able to patch this. But basically what was going on was this was a dev mode thing where uh, in dev mode, every request, it reloads all your application code in case it changed. But at the same time, there was a bunch of, bunch of caching logic in there as an optimization to speed things up that was caching all the partials associated with every controller. Uh, and the problem was basically since you were reloading all your controllers, they would get inserted into this hash over and over again. And the patch was really simple. Instead of using the actual class object, we used the class's object's name as the key. And so if you use the string test controller, it would just overwrite that entry over and over again instead of inserting a new entry. So that's, that's memprof, and again, if you're interested, bit.ly slash memprof has a lot more details uh, about not only memprof.com, but also sort of the APIs that you can use uh, even locally to try to debug stuff. So. Any questions about that? Cool. So this is the last tool, and I saved the best for last. If you do nothing else, I would recommend you definitely check this out, get up and running with this. And uh, what this is, is basically it's a Rack Pro Tools profiler. Is something that uh, Ben Brinkerhoff wrote, and it's basically wrap middleware around my Pro Tools RB project. And the way this works is you basically just pull in this middleware, and you can pull it into your Rails application, Snap, or you know whatever. It's just rack middleware. And once it's in there, uh, you can profile any web request. And the easiest way to do this is on any URL, you just append profile equals true, and times equals you know whatever, ten times, hundred times. Uh, and it'll spit back, instead of the actual 
response, it'll spit back the GIF profile that we saw earlier. And so this is extremely useful because on a per URL, per request basis, you can get a profile app. And it's so easy to get up and running. Uh, and this is the way I usually use it down here at the bottom where, you know, like the home page or you know a certain URL is taking a long time, you just append profile equals true, uh, take the output, stick in a GIF, open that in preview, and sure enough, you'll see, you know, the biggest boxes in there is where you need to start looking. And again, you can uh, set different modes. All three modes work with this, so you can do it in object allocation mode and see which functions are creating most objects, or we can do it in real-time mode and get a sense of what sort of I.O. and other uh, real-time operations taking on this. So that's it for most of the tools. Any questions about that one? Yeah. What yeah. other uh, printers are available besides GIF? Uh, the printers are, there's text, GIF, um, there's a couple other ones. If you check out the PerfTools RV documentation, it's basically all the ones that the PerfTools project itself exposes. Uh, there's like PS, um, there's like a PDF one, but it's basically either text or graphics. So that's, that's basically it, but the main point I wanted to make is, you know, like when you have a problem, uh, it's really easy to sort of ask what the fuck and be confused, but if you have the right tool to go to, then you can start chipping away at the problem. And it's all about knowing what tools to use. And so I really recommend, you know, at least start playing with these, get a sense of what's available, at least have in the back of your mind, you know, this use case, well, if there's a seg fault, GDB is kind of gonna do the right thing and let me know where to start looking. And once you have sort of stuff in your toolbox, when you run into problems, it's gonna be much easier to go into that toolbox, try to figure out what the right thing to use is, figure out what the problem is. And once you have at least a small clue about what's going on, then you can start making progress and end up fixing that issue. So that's it, any questions? <clears throat> yep. So I've tried to do these perf tools type things in a situation where I'm doing a lot of forking. A lot of them kind of fall flat on their face once you start forking because it's really hard to work across processes. Do you have any, uh, any of those in particular that you thought worked well or any other tools for debugging forks? Sure, the question was uh, how do you debug across forks? Uh, and perf tools actually does a really good job of this. The Google perf tools code itself uh, anytime you fork, it'll start the profile over again and basically take your profile or path and append a pit to it. Uh, and so it actually works pretty well. I don't know how well it's supported in my Ruby stuff, but it should be pretty seamless where it should just work. Uh, and so Perf Tools is definitely the one I would check out. Uh, the other way to do it is to you know, use some of the APIs directly and sort of uh, add some code where after you fork, you start the profile explicitly. Um, which can get a little bit messy, but it does work. Any other questions? Cool, thanks a lot.